Welcome back to Telltale Books Videos. I'm Greg. I'm Emily. And we are here in this video to talk about the next in our series about Robert Heinlein, his next work in his complete works as as far as we can figure Find it out. Find out, yeah. Um, this is number nine on my list and was published in September of 1940 in Astounding Science Fiction. The story is called Blow Ups Happen. And it's a novelette, so it's not exactly a short story. And yeah, it it's does, pretty long. It does fit so these, into... what, 40 pages? 40 pages, I think it was? Did yeah, something like that. Yeah. I, I suppose it depends on what you read it in. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, yeah, it, I read felt, it. it felt more almost like a novella to me. Mm -hmm. It was on the long side of novelettes. Mm -hmm. And of course, I have it in The Pass Through Tomorrow. And I found, read it on the PDF of uh, the, mag the science fiction magazine. Which one was it? Astounding? Astounding. Yeah. Science fiction, yep. And that was uh, September... September of 1940. 1940, yep. And... We found a PDF online. Interesting thing, that that issue also has a story by... Isaac Asimov called Homo Sol. Mm, I did see that. I saw an Asimov in there. And that story, too, talks about atomic power. Ooh, interesting. Um, though it's a little, little, it's very different from the Heinlein story, but okay. it also does make, and also does make the, that same reference of psychology and, mm -hmm. and, calculus being yeah. the same yeah they are the same subject. <laughs> so i'm thinking gee twice in the same issue john campbell They're didn't trying. have something to do with that did yeah. he because he i think someone's making a statement here <laughs> campbell campbell did oh. you know asimov mentions in home in his introduction in the early asimov to homo sol that campbell rewrote his story Mm. And he was kind of pissed about it. <laughs> oh, interesting. Because <laughs> um, in, he, he said he and Campbell had long-standing arguments about um, racial equality, mm. and uh, and that's that's what he didn't like about the way Campbell rewrote his story. Ah. Anyway, to get back to Robert Heinlein, this um, this is in Pass Through Tomorrow. It is part of his whole future history. Kind of fits early on, close to, um, we did one called Let There Be Light, which mm -hmm. dealt with solar power. Yes. And in this story, solar power is kind of established, but it's not being used to supply all the energy. Mm -hmm. Or it can't be for some reason, I remember, I recall. Like there's some it's reason not powerful it's not. Enough. Yeah. Um, and you got to, there's some, some interesting differences before we get into the synopsis. Reading the version in the Pass Through Tomorrow, it's kind of like if this goes on. He revised mm -hmm. it later. Yeah. Because the Pass Through Tomorrow was originally published in the 1960s, I believe. Okay. And before that, um, I think this story was collected into a, a book called uh, The Man Who Sold the Moon mm -hmm. by Heinlein in the early 1950s. And by then, of course... Um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened. Oh, yeah. The Manhattan Project became mm -hmm. public. And so he revised the story to take account of those developments. So mm -hmm. it was more up to date when he when he published it ah, in this book. Got it. So in the 1940 version, it lacks all that. Mm -hmm. But in 1938 or 39, somebody did achieve nuclear fission. Mm-hmm. And that did lead a lot of science fiction writers to start speculating about atomic power. And mm -hmm. that's where this story came coming from. Yes. Now, Heinlein, being an engineer, digs really deep yes, into he does. The, the technical aspects and the science mm -hmm. of what was known at that time. Yes. And there's an, an interesting thing that people thought before the bombs were dropped mm -hmm. in Japan. Um, that relates to something that goes on in the plot of the story. And so I'll turn it over to you for synopsis. All right. So the synopsis of the story follows quite a few characters, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, the story is about there is an atomic plant that generates power, 
and unfortunately there was an incident years ago where a man snapped under the pressure recognizing that this atomic plant was basically a giant bomb. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't help in the story that they just call it the bomb. <laughs> First of all, I'm pissed about that. I'm like, I'll, if, anyway, so what happens is... But think about Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, yeah, Chernobyl and the one in Japan that yes, got hit by the they are big earthquake. Bombs. They are bombs. Yes, they are. <laughs> But constantly calling it that in your professional work, it's a reactor. They call it a reactor because that's what it's doing. It's reacting. It's, rea it's, uh, it's, it's yes, PR. Yes, it's a bomb. <laughs> yes, but they keep, professionally, they just call it the bomb. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, no wonder everybody's so uptight. Anyway, so what happens in this incident? little context. Yeah. Two Rivers is very close to a nuclear power plant. Two of them. <laughs> We, we have, have two, two of them. Of them I very thought we close only had one. We Where's the other one? We have the uh, Point Beach and yeah. we have Kiwani. We're in the red blast zone oh. for both of them. Wow, we're yeah. doomed. <laughs> yeah, we're in the red zone. If those things go up, we're done. Yeah. But um, it'll be quick. <laughs> that's that's what I take comfort in. Anyway, so basically the incident is this guy under the pressure of working in this thing and realizing like how precarious and precise everything has to be and pressurized the guy snapped and became violent and basically went into a psychosis he was able to be calmed down but for some reason he blocked out all his ability to do math so now he's a secretary <laughs> at this establishment um but what ends up happening is because of that, they started regulating uh, the workers by having psychologists standing in and observing them. Mm -hmm. And through their observations, they decide if people are making careless mistakes or are burned out enough that they're kind of cracking under the pressure. And then they either have to be reallocated to a new spot in the plant and do some other type of work or they're fired, essentially. And I want to make an interesting statement with with real life history. Mm -hmm. Heinlein, um, in writing in writing this, it's not science fiction or fantasy. In the nineteen eighties, the air traffic controllers went on strike. Yeah. Because of how so many of them were cracking under the pressure of their jobs. Mm -hmm. When somebody is in a job like that, where they are constantly yeah. averting disaster every day, they go into work. It's stressful. It's extremely stressful, and it does wear wear them down mm -hmm. to where they can't function any, anymore. And and so the air traffic controllers went on strike to try and get something done about this. And of course, President Reagan fired them all. Yeah. And isn't that that's also why we, we had people. all those postal workers who suddenly became violent, just shot everything up? Do you remember that? It was a bunch yeah. of yeah. <laughs> the pressure. <laughs> anyway, who knows. But anyway, Looking human stamps is yeah. just the hardest thing you can possibly imagine. I know. Imagine. Getting all the mail right. <laughs> federal offenses. Gosh. Dogs. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I digress. Okay. So basically in this story, a psychologist reports a guy who had made a mistake because he thought the gentleman was cracking under pressure and about to depressurize something, like trigger the bomb essentially. Mm-hmm. And so he reports to the superior. The superior, of course, is not thrilled because he's just losing men left and right to, because these psychologists are reporting all these guys appearing to start showing signs of cracking under pressure. Um, so he reassigns the gentleman. That gentleman and another gentleman decide they're going to, tr in their new lab field, he's going to be reassigned, and they're going to see if they can find a way to make atomic power to get to space um, and something more powerful than the rocket fuel that exists. Yeah, specifically what they're looking for is a safe atomic fuel, yes. a stable atomic fuel. That they can get into space and go have lunch on the moon because yeah. he hadn't broken through the atmosphere yet mm -hmm. by this point. And so he and the other guy kind of have that side story of them pursuing. There's a lot of technical stuff, but the guy who is the gentleman general who is basically running this plant calls in a psychologist who also happens to be um, the a guy atop of his class in calculus and physics. And so the guy comes in and the guy explains, like, these guys are cracking under pressure. Like, I'm losing guys all the time. These are some of the most brilliant minds in the world, but they have to be sensitive because they have to understand the, pre like, they have to understand the weight of what they're doing. 
So we can't just hire sociopaths who are brilliant. We need people who actually care about how this can environmentally impact people. And so the psychologist is like, okay, I'm going to stay and observe for a while and start asking questions and see what I can figure out. Mm -hmm. So he does so, and he goes around, and he's asking questions and meeting with everybody, and he basically runs into these other two guys, the guy who had been reassigned. Um, they're really close to coming to finding uh, atomic power that's safer. And so, but he comes back to the general, he's like, honestly, your only option is to decommission this whole building. Mm -hmm. We just need to dump the bomb. Like, there's no way. And he, the guy's like, I can't. Yeah. Like it, the too much power is generated it's by like this a thing. We are of the world's power. Yeah, is we are out of dependent this on this Plus, plant. they need it for as a breeder reactor. Yeah, and it is the only plant mm -hmm. like it's of its kind, mind you. Yeah, and it's in the Arizona desert. So. Yeah, yeah, and so he's like, too, the world is too dependent on this plant. We can't mm -hmm. just decommission it. We've mm -hmm. got to figure something else out. And the guy's like, there isn't. You're just gonna keep losing guys. They're gonna keep going insane. And you're never going to get them back. And we're going to get a lower and lower quality over time yep. of mines that can man manage this thing. Mm -hmm. And so the guy's just like at odds. And then the naval general <laughs> shows up unannounced. is like, I'm glad you two are here. Check this shit out. <laughs> and he basically lays out the math and says, the math of this thing is way more like is not working out as correctly as previously thought. Like, this is a lot more unstable than we realized. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of technical stuff, and they start figuring out. And then the guy's like, I have a theory. He's like, the craters on the moon are kind of weird, right? And the guys are like, what does that have to do with anything? And he's like, no, 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 like, hear me out. A lot of these craters are unexplainable unless there was some kind of unusual impact. And how could something impact the moon and not hit us, too? And so he's like kind of going into it. He's like, I have a theory that maybe atomic power had been found before by another life that was on the moon and they fucked up <laughs> real bad. Mm -hmm. And now the moon is the moon. And what if it was just like our planet first? And so the guys are freaking out because they're like, okay, well, shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more unstable, all this stuff. We got to call the board. And talk about it. And the board is just like, fuck you guys. No, you're stupid. This is fine. We've had it looked over a million times. It's great. They basically didn't want to lose all no, the money. No, they didn't and, want to lose their money. deal with all the chaos of shutting yeah. that reactor down. Absolutely. So then they take the alternate route. It's like, all right. They try to force uh, the head of the plant into retirement. He's like, all right, it's time to play dirty now. And basically they go to the board again. And he's like, I'm going to take this time of, of my hearing to talk about the smear campaign <laughs> that we can develop to get public opinion so riled up about this, they're just going to come over here and rip you apart. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he basically lays out this whole thing, and they're like, this is blackmail. And he's like, no, it's the truth. But also, here's another campaign that we can have that's a little gentler. Mm -hmm. And so... By this point, the two other scientists had figured out a way to have rocket propulsion safely with atomic particles and isotopes and all that fun yeah. stuff. Yeah, but and they so, still need the breeder reactor to make their, yes. their stable atomic fuel. Yes, so they pull up this idea of what if we send the reactor to space mm -hmm. far enough away that it's not going to harm us if it blows up in a vacuum, mm -hmm. but we can still get energy from it. Yeah. And so that's what they do. Yeah. But there's a lot of really exciting things that happen towards the end. Because some guy loses his shit and they think that it's all going to blow up. And it almost does. Mm -hmm. But then they incapacitate the guy. Actually, they shoot him dead. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but yeah, okay. so blow-ups happen is both psychological as well as literal yeah. in this case. Which exactly. is kind of fun about which the is, story. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Um the story, if you want to try reading it, be prepared. It is very, it's very technical. technical. It's very scientific. There isn't everything and I understood. It's, it's pretty accurate as far as the date when Heinlein wrote it. Um, the original 1940 story was accurate to what was understood 
you know, outside of the Manhattan Project um, by s top theoretical physicists in 1940. And then when he rewrote it in the early 50s, he took into account, you know, the public knowledge of Manhattan Project and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, he worked them in there, but still did not really change his stories. So he gets very technical. Mm -hmm. um, if you have some understanding of atomic physics, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what had been worked in my favor is I just recently watched the Chernobyl miniseries. So I had a little bit of an understanding for how it was explained in that to kind of understand what this is. But honestly, there was a lot that was a lot deeper and a lot more technical than I understood. Mm -hmm. It's easy to read. You can kind of just skim over those parts. It's easy to read when you understand it's all freaking dangerous. Yeah. Um, and the psychology is interesting, too. Mm -hmm. That's the parts that I actually enjoyed more, were when he's talking about people and understanding how the human reaction to stress and all these other things. Which is so funny that we have two stories that we read now that are, like, putting a type of person under stress. We just finished reading, what was it, The Crystal Cup. Mm -hmm. Putting artists under stress mm -hmm. versus putting physicists and engineers under stress. Uh -huh. And it's just so interesting how the human mind reacts to stress. Right. And I felt like it was perfectly accurate. Accurate. It was perfectly normal. Yeah, like like I say, it it sounded exactly like the whole um, air traffic controller strike and yeah. what they were dealing with and and the situation that they faced that they were trying to mm -hmm. change by going on strike because you know just pointing it out and saying something needs to change wasn't getting any changes yeah. happening. Yes. People were losing so their jobs and breaking under the pressure, having to go to therapy, ruining mm -hmm. their own lives over stuff. Mm -hmm. It was bad. Yeah. Was bad so situation. this story, it, you know, like we say, it works on so many different levels. One interesting thing, the whole idea in it, that such a reactor could possibly explode in a way that would destroy the whole world, mm -hmm. like it destroys the whole moon. Mm -hmm. That is something that they thought was a possibility before they actually dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. The fact that they were splitting atoms and creating a chain reaction, they weren't sure that it wouldn't just keep going ah. and split all the atoms of the entire Earth's atmosphere oh, yeah. and just turn the Earth into a fireball. They thought, and I haven't seen it yet. I want to see Oppenheimer because I bet this was mm -hmm. in part of that movie. I would love to see that. Um, they, they really did have this fear, the physicists. I mean, mm -hmm. Einstein and Oppenheimer and all these guys were, were afraid that this was a real possibility. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when you consider, what is it? Like 1% of the Earth's atmosphere is sulfur, and if it was any more than exactly 1%, we could just ignite our atmosphere. <laughs> I mean, the chemistry is so precise. Mm -hmm. And so it's so interesting that I understand mm -hmm. that fear, that mm -hmm. something you do might actually have that substantial of a change. Yeah. Ooh, I get it. You know, I'm not when, a scientist, though. So. When, you, when you look at... Einstein's equation, it's the con complete conversion of mass to energy. Mm -hmm. And so they knew they were messing with that. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't sure that they weren't going to just mass. convert all mass into, yes. all, into energy and just completely blow the earth to oblivion. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it didn't happen. <clears throat> but it was because, um, you know, matter and... Um, particle physics is it doesn't just keep chain reacting it, it the things do die die off with distance mm -hmm. and so it, it couldn't just keep going but you know so we don't have a safeguards. butterfly yeah there's no Built butterfly the effect here yeah, yeah. Um, so that total destruction of the earth couldn't happen but they didn't know that before they tried it. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a scary thing is, well, they let's live, just blow it off and see. Let's just find <laughs> out. You know, yeah, let's, that's horrifying. Let's, let's drop well, a bomb and Well, you must have had enough scientists that are like, mm, probably not. Probably no, they, not. they really were afraid mm -hmm. that the moment they did it, that, the, that it would ignite the whole atmosphere. Mm -hmm. They really were fearful of that, and they really didn't know for sure mm -hmm. until they tried it, and it didn't happen. 
That was risky. All right, never again. I get it now. Now I get the whole fear of weapons of mass destruct. I mean, that was very destructive anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, interesting. So yeah, it's interesting that Heinlein had that in his in his story, and and it's also interesting that he he decided to keep it in in mm -hmm. the nineteen fifties when he knew that wasn't a possibility anymore. Mm -hmm. He he kept it in because it was such a major point in the story, and of course the whole thing about the new the moon. Mm -hmm. Once having had an atmosphere and civilization is just total bunk. Yeah, <laughs> pure it's science still fiction. Still fun to play with. Yeah, though. it is. A, it is a it's really a fun, fun part of the story, mm -hmm. but it's it's the hardest one to swallow. You know, in a story that is so technical mm -hmm. and so accurate scientifically for its time, mm -hmm. and then he has that in there. It's almost like throwing Scientology into the middle of, of the whole thing. You yeah. know. Um, we're going to throw a moon <laughs> theory in here. Yeah. You believe in the moon? Yeah, or, you know, or talking about really advanced physics and then throwing in Velikovsky's <laughs> worlds in collision into the middle of it. Yeah. Um, Something it's completely pretty, unrelated. It's pretty bizarre. Throw Fitz into it. Suddenly Fitz shows up. And it's, what's with this puppet that's sending in esoteric needles? No, sorry. <laughs> But this is mm -hmm. pure science fiction at its highest. It's very scientific, very technical, yes. and the very it has this complex interweaving of, of psychology and physics and mm -hmm. mathematics, which is really cool. I love that. Um, I love that combination, especially since hard. You know, the golden age hard science fiction is usually characterized as about. Just the hard sciences, physics, chemistry, math. Yeah. Um, and things like psychology and sociology are not usually seen as a part of it. Mm -hmm. But there are a fair number of stories, like Nightfall mm -hmm. by Isaac Asimov, <clears throat> and now this one, Blobs yeah. Happened by, by Heinlein, that are very much about a soft science, psychology. Yes, yes. And that's kind of one of the things, too. I went to a religious, a private college that was religious-based. And one of the things that we talk about a lot is that there's many ways to translate different things. And that's why all these are interconnected. Like, I may not be a super big math person, but the second I got into geometry, that's how I knew I was a visual artist. Because geometry made sense. <laughs> and yeah. other math didn't for me until then. But, mm -hmm. you know, science interprets nature and art interprets nature and mathematics interprets nature and all these things interpret our understanding of the world and they're all so interconnected like you can't have one without the other and right you know literature interprets nature or you know humanity or whatever like all of it is so interconnected that i can't i no longer see any of it as separate genres no, anymore they're so interconnected and so that's what I appreciated about this is, of course, of course, psychology and calculus are the same thing. They're just <laughs> interpretations of each other. Like, especially when you start getting into statistics and stuff, too. Like, you need that to quantify a lot of things mm -hmm. um, that aren't otherwise, there's no other way of measuring. The difficulty with that mm -hmm. is that our science is so advanced now that you have to specialize yes. in order to really understand a part of of some of a scientific field yes you know you, you can't even just be general physics anymore no. you have to specialize in a certain area of physics in order to really mm -hmm. wrap your mind around all of it and become an expert yes but it's still and so it does kind of compartmentalize something you know things that are totally mm -hmm. interrelated so there's no one person on this planet that really understands all that. Exactly, and that's why we need each other. That's why it's so holistic. That's why we mm -hmm. all need each other. And that's why I'm a collectivist and <laughs> not an individualist. But that's because that's why we need these things in order to be able to fully understand our world and to be able to fully interpret it correctly. Mm -hmm. And of course, things are we're learning new <clears throat> things all the time, which can be scary and unusual, but all of it is just interpreting our world, and most of it is interpreting nature. Yeah, but what we're seeing happen in, in our society right now is that science is so advanced that the vast majority of people can't even 
have an expertise in right. one little area of science. The vast majority of people just don't get it. Yes. They, they maybe they understand the popular notions mm -hmm. about a scientific field, but they really don't have a true understanding of what's going on. Yes. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of movements against science, a lot of flat earthers, a lot of, a lot of um, junk, junk science, a lot of conspiracy theories around it, mm -hmm. because they don't understand it, and they want to understand it, but they can't. Yes. And so people are reacting against it. Uh, they're reacting against something that has grown far beyond them. And it, it's almost like you've got a portion of the people on the earth that can can wrap their head around parts of it, mm -hmm. and together they can can understand the whole. Yes. And they're the ones that are coming up with the inventions and, and the theories and you know mm -hmm. moving science things. forward. Yeah. But the rest of humanity is so far behind them mm -hmm. that they can't possibly catch up. Yes. I agree. And I think I even in this like so much of that mm -hmm. I'm just skimming over with an understanding that this is dangerous. Yeah. It's a bomb. Yeah. And I think that's probably why he was so selective with his words. The people who don't understand the technical aspect of it would still understand the danger. Well, he was. He knew. You know, in 1940, in astounding stories, it was assumed that you were writing for a that's, teenage audience, mm -hmm. teenage boys, not. Physicists, you were learning them PhDs. a thing. Mm -hmm. Even though there were people with PhDs that read the magazine, mm -hmm. it, it was generally assumed in publishing that science fiction was being read by kids. Yeah. And someone like, like Heinlein, he wrote these stories because he did want to utilize that fun, kind of adventurous story mm -hmm. to teach mm -hmm. some real science. Mm -hmm. Even though some of what he was putting in the story was not real science, mm -hmm. it was science fiction. And it's story There was enough mm -hmm. real science in that story that yeah. it would make it would make them want make the, the teenagers reading the the story want to know more mm -hmm. and want to go into science, which really did happen. Yes. A lot of those kids that read that magazine, they did become scientists mm -hmm. and they did you know, a lot of the inventions we have, you look back at the at the old science fiction stories and, and people go, oh, you know, Asimov and Heinlein predicted that way mm -hmm. back then. No, they didn't really predict it. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. They wrote about it in 1940 and then these kids went out and made it happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't predict it. Maybe he manifested it. No. Yeah. <laughs> Vicariously. Made them start thinking, how can we make this happen, you know? Mm -hmm. This and, could be an interesting so world if we did that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too that's why it's so. That's why it's so interesting to read it because you can feel that it is very intellectual, but you're still getting an interesting story with moments of chaos and drama and you know humor and oh yeah drinking buddies trying to figure out how to make bullshit. <laughs> I, th I thought the characterization was really good. Yes, you know, and people they're are always remarkably down. deep. Mm -hmm. they're remarkably deep characters. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a longer, it's a longer short story, but yeah. they are remarkably deep. And while you, you can't really get into the psychological issue without mm -hmm. doing some decent characterization, yes. So he did, and so the, the people that are they're always saying how classic science fiction has such bad characterization. Well, you're not reading the right mm -hmm. classic stories. And to come <laughs> back to your point too about people not understanding the science so much, mm -hmm. we even have a character in this story who doesn't understand the science. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the bartender, the Italian mm -hmm. bartender? He had stomach cancer, so he decided to move to Paradise, which is basically right at the base of the hill that this freaking uh, plant bomb. is on. Yeah, the bomb is on. <laughs> and the guys go, aren't you scared of living this close to the bomb on their way out? And the guy's like, no, the bomb's my friend. And they're like, what? And he's like, yeah, I had stomach cancer. I moved here to make enough money to give my family a good, you know, end of life, you know, a good life after I'm gone and try to make a lot of money. And he's mm -hmm. like, and my stomach cancer's gone now. The radiation killed his stomach cancer. Right. But it, it he doesn't understand. He, like, he thinks, oh, yeah, it's, it's fine. Like, it helped me, so it must not be that bad. Mm -hmm. But he is that ignorant 
and we have no other term for it, they, he's an ignorant person who just is living his life off of the plant like mm -hmm. any other person would, like we do with our own nuclear plants mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it kind of feeds into the story that you're saying about people being so far behind of understanding what the actual science is. Yeah. We're already seeing that in this story, too. And you really have to remember, this was first published in September of 1940. At that time, nobody knew about Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. It was top secret. Mm -hmm. Even Heinlein wouldn't have known anything about it. I wonder if he it. had some people show up at his door in dark suits. John Campbell did. He had the FBI investigate him because of stories... Like this? That's like awesome. this, that Astounding was publishing. <gasps> That's fun. You know, well, well because Good he times. had people who were extremely intelligent and they were reading Einstein and, you know, the Oh shit, stuff he's getting was, too close, we Stuff go. that was public and yeah. they were putting two and two together and figuring it out. Yeah. And so they were able to figure out atomic bombs, atomic power plants, before those things even existed. Mm -hmm. And they wrote about them. Wow. And so Crazy. Heinlein was writing about breeder reactors and atomic power plants at a time when those things didn't even exist yet. Mm -hmm. At least not as far as Heinlein knew. Yep. <coughs> Such a good read. It is. So, Top Tale, definitely. Yep, absolutely. That Without was a fun a one. This is one that... Yeah. Again, even if you're not into the technical, <laughs> there's still enough to understand that you'll still enjoy it. Yeah, well, and, and like I say, Heinlein wrote that technical to try and get people to start yeah. wondering and wanting to know. So, give it a chance, and whatever you don't understand, Google it, or go to the library and, and look this stuff up and learn some things about it and become a little more technically and scientifically literate <laughs> so that you aren't quite so far behind like I was saying so many people just have no real clue yeah they only have popular notions of how science works mm -hmm. and they don't really know the details they don't really know what it's all about mm -hmm. and so they have a lot of misconceptions yeah. you know people constantly think of black holes as holes no, not, not exactly. Not it's just really. an infinitesimal mass. Infinitesimally small mass. Yep. It's not really a hole. And Google what that means. <laughs> yeah. Figure it out. Report yeah, that. Well, most people don't have the idea that when a star explodes, it it has outward pressure, but it has inward pressure mm -hmm. also. It implodes that and it forces the core of that star down to collapse at the speed of light. And it can't possibly escape itself. It just keeps collapsing and collapsing and collapsing and collapsing forever. That's cool. And that's a black hole. What an amazing universe we live in. Mm -hmm. Well, I have nothing else to say. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, very heady story, but try it. Mm -hmm. um, once you dig in and once you look up the terms and, and dig into the science and understand it, um, you will have a much deeper uh, concept of the world around you. Mm -hmm. And then there's so much more you can get into if you if you want to. Yes. Otherwise, you can go back to your Sarah J. Mass, very, very point and, point and you know, as long as you're not Gosh, voting. you were really on Sarah J. Mass well, eating. I mean, it's just, it's just because there's this explosion of that kind of book all of a sudden. Yeah. And maybe they're... It's kind of becoming old. But they're not like bad it. books, but it's just... Now all the books are that kind yeah, of book. Yeah, it's like... No, I get it. It's, getting ridiculous. Give me something fresh and new. This is fresh and new to me, even though it was written in 1940. Yeah, it so really is. So enjoy it. Break up your, your fairy porn and your... <laughs> <laughs> your dark fantasies and learn something and real. learn something new and real and enjoy it i did yeah but i tend to like textbooks i read them for fun <laughs> i loved the silmarillion it was like reading a textbook and i loved it i'll give you my calculus textbook no i'll kill myself <laughs> i would rather it's die great. or my, my old, brother my would love textbook. that my brother loves that kind of stuff my anyway, physics textbook the, the appendix <laughs> takes apart and explains um, e equals mc squared and how it was derived. Oh, no. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's, it's the coolest Actually, 40 I probably would enjoy it more than I think I do. I think because read. it's like, 
it's math, I'm automatically like, it was not my strong subject, but I actually might, now that I'm older, I might have better comprehension. But it's just the same as psychology. Allegedly. <laughs> yes, it is. It's just a different means of explaining it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Like, subscribe, comment, let us know what you think of this story. If you have other Heinlands that you are looking forward to hearing from us about, comment those as well. And we'll see you next time. All right. Bye.